Hey everybody, this is Joy Forrest and I'm here again today with my friend Chris Moles. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I always like to say thanks for being had. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, today I've been, Chris and I actually recorded this before and for some reason my computer did not save it. So we're going to hope and pray it works this time. Uh, but maybe there was something we need to say that additionally that we missed last time. Maybe. And if it doesn't go well, we'll just say, man, you should have heard the first one. <laughs> That's right. So good. That's right. So what we're going to talk about is church discipline and domestic abuse. So um, one of the things I told Chris when I first read his book, I was going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then I get to the chapter about when he went to this meeting of victims and I went, oh yeah, yeah. Amen, brother. Amen. So I'm going to let you tell <laughs> your experience. We're going to just start out with stories. We'll tell your story and then I'll tell mine. Yeah. So that, um, that was probably the first time. I had been invited to the shelter. It's funny that that same story was used not long ago to, to really criticize me. And the, uh, the accusation was made that I'd probably never been back to that shelter. And oh. so I shared that critique with our advocate, our, uh, the lady who runs the shelter. And uh, she thought that was hilarious. And I shared it with her at that, that shelter. So we're, <laughs> uh, I do still have contact with that group and still work with our, our local shelter. And <clears throat> we're actually moving locations, which is great because now we'll be able to house women instead of just being a support group place, which is awesome. So anyway, uh, that was probably my first experience. It was the prior advocate. So uh, we've had a couple advocates in there, both of them amazing. And this advocate called me one day and she uh, she basically said, hey, Chris, we've got an entire group of women right now in our support group who are Christians. They have lots of questions, and I just don't feel qualified to answer them. Would you come and just do a Q&A with them? And, uh, and that was just a great experience for me, and I've been able to do a few of those since. It's just an honor to go help in that way. And so I just walked in with my Bible, set, introduced myself, and uh, the ladies began to ask me questions. And as the process rolled on I, I wanted to get to know the ladies better and we were just talking and I can't come to find out as we're interacting that uh, all of the women except for one in that group had been through some sort of official church discipline process and uh, of all the women only one uh, lady in that group that it was a small group I can't recall how many maybe seven six or seven ladies but only one had really received solid support from her church and the other ladies had been through all of them had been through some form of church discipline and primarily for separation or divorce or involving the police and as i heard these ladies stories it was they were so graphic uh, all of them their husbands were involved in the court system in some way for criminal activity and yet the the majority overwhelming majority of the women were being disciplined by their church and one woman in particular her husband through the process had been promoted to leadership currently with criminal charges. And he's serving as uh, whatever the equivalent was. I will, I'll say a deacon. It was a, a secondary leadership role, but a significant one within the church. And she was being disciplined and it was just super heartbreaking. I've come to find out since then, this was early on in my time in the work. And I've come to discover since then that church discipline has been a very, very tricky issue within domestic violence. And most of the time when I hear church discipline used, um, I'm hearing it in the context of being used against a victim uh, as opposed to being used uh, with a perpetrator. And I think there's some understandable reasons for that. I think it's part of the machinery of the church and people kind of get caught in the machinery because as I've said many times, domestic violence is the most misunderstood and therefore mismanaged problem in the church. Amen, brother. It sure is. So my experience is, and you know, um, back in 2000 and 2001, God <laughs> opened a door, like he's flung open a door. So I ended up working in a domestic violence shelter was not my plan. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was working, my job was to be the community educator. Um, but I also ended up um, going to the support groups on a regular basis right. and, and running them from time to time when the main leader was out of uh, town. So um, I heard lots and lots and lots of stories during those couple of years. And um, what really got me uh, was women were, were coming in and saying things like, 
why does my pastor care more about my marriage than my life? Why does my pastor keep sending me back to abuse? It's like all they could see was the marriage. They weren't seeing the individual right. in the marriage. And so um, that, that was concerning to me. I had seen that I, my church didn't know how to deal with it, but thankfully I was in more of a mainline church at the time. And so I really never had to worry about church discipline, but I did know that they, they didn't know how to, to handle the problem. But as I was listening and, you know, to these women coming in, I thought, well, I'm just going to do some kind of a, we'll reach out to pastors and we'll reach right. out to teachers. And, you know, we reached out to every church in our, the small community that we were in, um, sent out these um, self-addressed stamped envelopes with 10 question survey out of 200, we got 10 back. And most wow. of those were filled out by women in positions in mm -hmm. the church. Yeah. Um, our, I would say that our, you know, our, little event that we had for the pastor was, was not very successful. Um, and in the meantime, I continue to see these women coming in. Um, and then as I moved over into church counseling, after God called me to seminary, I move over into church counseling and I start seeing more and more as people hear, okay, she knows about domestic abuse. Yep. I start hearing the same stories over and over again, the same thing, so much church discipline mostly aimed at the victim um, because she decided to separate mm -hmm. or um, divorce or, you know, basically, well, he was repentant and she is given up on the marriage. Well, right. uh, this is something I'm going to say right here. And I've said it mm -hmm. before that the only person who can judge true repentance is a victim. Okay. Domestic violence ranges from a look to murder. Mm -hmm. And that there is a look that we as victims understand and know there were, there was a look yep. that my abuser had back in the day. He could give me this look and it would just, it would, I would freeze up on the inside. I would, pa I would go into an internal panic. I couldn't yep. even, I could barely function. It freaked me out so much when he looked at me that way. And yep. so how can anybody know that look except for the one who has experienced it over and over again? Yeah. You know, I, that reminds me too. I was having this conversation with someone recently because in, in addition, I think you're correct in how we judge and operate within repentance. And what we tend to do is we tend to call a victim to forgive quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we also don't really delineate what repentance is that or what forgiveness is. I should say that there's this judicial declarative forgiveness, there's relational aspects of forgiveness that may not follow. Uh, and what I mean by that is I've worked with many churches who say are dealing with an, a case of adultery. And uh, it's, you know, longstanding adultery and the husband goes through the process, he repents, and they expect the wife to practice that judicial forgiveness, but they don't necessarily hold her to the relational forgiveness. They really leave that up to her because they understand that there's whatever grounds for divorce or whatever you have, they understand that that'd be a very difficult process. I don't see the same type of grace given in cases of abuse. And that's what I would ask for too, because there are instances, I'm working with a guy right now, what a transformation. But the reason why we know there's transformation is he's not holding his wife hostage or the marriage. He, he just willingly and graciously says, I've ruined this. I'll sign the papers. I, I know that I'm earned everything that I'm getting. And so I don't want to push you, blah, blah, blah. How wonderful, right? That's what we want. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that the church can come alongside the victim in that case and say, you know what? He's really repentant. You should get back into a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. and, and then also to expect it so quickly, should we not be coaching people who've been harmed and take the time to really walk them through what forgiveness is and what it isn't? rather than just saying you have to forgive now and forgiveness always looks like this. That would be my other uh, take on it would be, yeah, we want the victim to judge repentance and really practice that. But at the same time, we want them to eventually come to a place of forgiveness if a person's repentant, but why do we pull the trigger so quick and demand it so fully? Well, I think that a lot of times what happens is, and I did this. I mean, I separated, reconciled, separated, yep. reconciled every single time it got worse. And so I've seen, I know Jim, Jim Newhouser wrote, wrote an article about how mm -hmm. that when finally the man is repentant and then she's done. Uh, right. The, we call it the baked potato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I understand the, the reason mm -hmm. for that. There's a couple of things. One, we need to talk about the effects of trauma on a person. Yep. But the second thing is trust. 
<laughs> you can forgive. I was able to freely forgive. And finally, God showed me. I thought that forgiveness meant that I had to reconcile. I right. kept come back and it kept getting worse and worse. And it finally got to the point where I realized I can't trust this man. And the more I go back, I'm going to end up dead if I keep yep. going back. So yep. I tell people all the time, tr you know, forgiveness is freely given. Trust has to be earned. And uh, yep. so I think part of it is the, the trust factor. And again, uh, eight, about 80% of domestic violence victims have uh, some form of PTSD, the complex PTSD right. probably. And so that really changes a person that uh, it's like the women I talked to They, you know, one of the ladies in our group said, Oh my, I was in the store yesterday and my ex walked in and, and I just freaked and I ran behind the counter. I mean, you know, yep. they're running for their lives and it, there's really no danger in a public place, but that's how much they're affected. It's, mm -hmm. Sends this adrenaline throughout their bodies, and if they don't have time, a long enough separation period for them to heal, yeah, it's not gonna. I mean, how can they? How can you have a healed marriage when the person, right. the people in it, are not healed? So that's we, exactly. That's exactly what I'm. I'm pulling it. I think if somebody were to read your story, if they were to pick up the book, for instance, and to read your story, they would see the real depth of hurt and pain. And I don't think there would be anybody who would read that story or even just read the section on the, the dumpster. I think the dumpster um, part of the story to me is the most descriptive. And so let's say they just read that story in your book. I think most, most reasonable people would say, wow, she really needs to get away. And, but you've come to a place now where that relationship will never be restored, nor should it. It was broken beyond repair, but you've come to a place of forgiveness. And that makes all the difference, Joy, because now you're able to do the work that you're able to do so well, because you've been able to experience God's grace, receive his hope, and then offer forgiveness that's, that's reasonable. So I think those are the type of things I long for with victims is to live in that kind of freedom. Uh, and that's why we use those terms, victims, survivors, right? There's just kind of a delineation when somebody steps and walks into freedom. Yeah. Amen. Well, I mean, I, and I've seen it. I've seen them, you know, we, what, we, what I really believe needs to be the goal of the church is that we need to <clears throat> restore relationship with God because I'm mm -hmm. every, every victim that I've ever worked with had a damaged relationship with yep. God. And, um, and the, the perpetrator obviously has uh -huh. a relationship with God. So the goal of counseling with these folks should be restored relationship with God and God can do anything. Mm -hmm. And isn't it funny that that is the goal of church discipline, isn't it? It's supposed to be. <laughs> it's supposed to be. And I think what's happened with church discipline, and I, I, do, I do think that in the 20th century and leading into the 21st century, the church has really muddied the waters on, on what the church is. And so it's made it very hard to do church discipline because once upon a time, you know, your relationship with God and your relationship to the local church was much more closely tied together. And now church is such a commodity that it's it's really different. We don't have time to get into the whole how church has become Walmart, and so pastors have to work harder to keep their customers, which is actually just, ah, right? That's a whole different story. But I think it has muddied the waters on church discipline because church discipline, scripturally speaking, is remedial. It's about uh, intensive discipleship in moments of needed correction. And so we're talking about two parties, and I think you're seeing the need for remedial discipleship for both parties. The victim needs that restored relationship with God. You've said it so well, God needs to be God. She needs to value God more than she does her abuser, or worship, her, worship God, not worship the abuser. And that takes remedial discipleship. So there's a disciplinary aspect to it. It's not punitive, though. And I think that's where we kind of get caught up. We always think discipline's punitive. Whereas the perpetrator, also needs a restored relationship with God. And there is a punitive aspect because there's also in his disciplinary process, trying to discern whether or not he's a believer at all. Yeah. Because it's like the old preacher said, we've got to get him unsaved so we can get him saved. Right. And so we have to come to a conclusion. That's why discipline's important because with a perpetrator, we're going to a goal, a conclusive goal, which is we're either going to see evidentiary repentance real long-standing repentance, or we're going to see rebellion. That way, you know, it's uh, like Jesus says, he's either hot or he's cold, right? We've got to get to an, uh, one or the other, right? And what I'm seeing with a lot of churches who are trying, and I commend churches for attempting church discipline, 
But I think one of the things I'm seeing is this elongated process of trying to resolve a conflict between, rather than restore people's relationship with God. Amen. Well, and I, for those of, there may be people watching who don't even understand ter the terminology church discipline. It's not really written yeah. in the Bible as church discipline, of course, right. just like many of our, uh, much of our theology um, based on mostly Matthew chapter 18, maybe mm -hmm. something in First Corinthians. First um, Corinthians 5, Titus 3, and then there's a plethora of others. I mean, and we can go through some of those passages and maybe how I use them. I, I use them quite a bit in perpetrator work. Yeah. So I would say, um, to me, the Matthew 18 passage, where if your brother sins against him, um, you know, go to him, let him know, you know, this is sin and you know, mm -hmm. you confront the sin. And then if he doesn't listen, then you take a witness and then eventually mm -hmm. you tell, end up telling the church. And then if he doesn't listen, then mm -hmm. you basically put him out of the church and treat him yep. as an unbeliever. Treat him as an unbeliever, which means, to my, my point, means we evangelize him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what we have seen in cases of church discipline has just been, it's been very punitive. You know, you're being punished. You are not following the, uh, you know, the orders of the church. I mean, it's right. just, it, almost, it, it really becomes secondary abuse. And, and so because these, these churches have set themselves up in this position of authority and you have to submit to their authority. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it is... I've just seen it do so much damage. And so, I mean, my, I guess my plea in this whole thing is, you know, I don't think this is the place for somebody who is the, the passage that keeps coming to my mind. Um, as I was, I told you before we got started is um, Isaiah 42, um, you know, talking about Jesus and it says a bruised reed, he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out in faithfulness. He will bring forth justice. Uh -huh. Um, and, and that is what I think that we're called to do. And I feel like that we are, we are snuffing out these <laughs> smoldering. Yep. Wicks. I see so many victims walking away from the church forever. I'm like, uh, you know, it, sometimes they walk away from their faith, you know, yep. the question is, were they truly believers? I don't know, but yep. I have seen it do so much damage to so many people, not to mention their children where <laughs> they're seeing scripture used as a weapon instead of the living active word of God that yeah. is supposed to be life-giving. It's taking. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so I think you're correct that we've somewhat weaponized uh, church discipline. And I, maybe one of the reasons, and I don't, I don't know, I have just the privilege of pastoring a small church. And most of the time, I, I've seen this mostly in larger settings. I've seen some small churches practice this. And by small church, I'm, I'm talking the average American church, less than 90 people. I, I tend to see it handled a little better on a smaller level because of the familial nature of the church. And that's what I think discipline, we, we need to put that back in the category of familial and spiritual. And why I say that is I think when Jesus is giving us Matthew 18, it's far less a mechanism for an institution, right? As it is a procedure for brothers and sisters, so it's familial. And then two, the passage is the same place where we find where two or three are gathered, he's in the middle. It's highly spiritual. In fact, I'll have uh, one of the guys at our church, he often says, you know, because we're so small, he'll say, well, two, where two or three are gathered, and then I'll jokingly say, we can kick somebody out. I mean, it's, that's, that's the context, is, is the disciplinary thing, but Jesus is in the process. And here's the irony of it. I think what we may have done is we have mirrored the Western legal system, right? The courts, as opposed to mirrored the family. And, and what I mean by that is most of the time, and maybe you've encountered this, when I encounter a victim who's being disciplined, it, it's highly punitive, highly legislative, and involves an investigation. So it's treated much more criminally than it is restoratively. And so when my kids do something wrong, I'm responsible to God to discipline them. And I think there is this misconception that discipline and punishment are the same thing. And they're just not always the same thing. There are different approaches to different aspects. So if my, I have two boys and let's say they have a, a major conflict, right? Where one of the boys, their, their term right now, pardon my language, but one of them recently called the other one a butt face jerk. That was the, you butt face jerk. So we have to have a conversation, right? Because 
butt face jerk is not an appropriate way to refer to your brother. And so Ephesians 4 is going to come into play. Let no unwholesome talk come into your mouth, but only what's good for building others up. That's disciplinary that we're correcting him for using words that are condemning as opposed to using words that are productive. He doesn't have to like his brother. He doesn't have to approve of what his brother's doing in the moment, but he does have to use proper channels to address it. And the proper way to address it is stop that. I don't appreciate it. I don't like it. They're not treating me well. If he does it again, then he, then he goes to authority, which is dad, right? Well, that's discipline. He didn't need to be punished or restricted. He just needed to be corrected at that point and given the opportunity to succeed. Well, that's completely different if one of my boys, they hit the other one. Well, that requires a little more stringent discipline. So I would love for us to get back to the familial model. In fact, I've told my church before, you know, people say, does your church practice discipline? My, my people would probably say, I don't think so, but we practice discipline all the time. Church discipline's happening constantly in the life of any church. If you're talking to people about their struggles, about their sin, about other people's sin, you're in that process of church discipline. And my fear is we've made it a mechanism rather than just a way of life. Yeah. Amen. I agree. Um, and it's, it's very, very sad. Um, but what is, what's so interesting to me is that, like you said, I have seen it so many times against victims and very rarely against perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, and so what do you think that is? I think perhaps, um, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons. One is that this is a very, it's a problem that thrives in secrecy. And so yeah. a lot of times an abusive person can look so charming and mm -hmm. people believe the spin, the story. Yeah. I just did a bunch of interviews with um, local pastors and I was asking um, Brian Metzger, who's the pastor of the Vineyard Church here in Raleigh, who said, I said, what do you wish that you knew back when you got out of seminary that you've learned about domestic violence? And his thing was, just believe her. Don't become an investigator. He says, because right. when you do that, you uh, inadvertently uh, are re-victimizing her. You're, yeah. you're adding to the abuse. And the reason he said that was, you know, he had seen it over and over through the years. And we know that false mm -hmm. claims are very, very rare. Much more rare than we're being told. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's like I've I've read something like three to seven percent or four to eight percent. It's less right. than you know ninety percent. And so I tell people, I think that when somebody is you know making a false claim, eventually that will come out, um, and yeah. that's why it's important to bring in uh, experts to help you to navigate the the you know the muddy water muddied waters yeah. of domestic abuse because it is a very difficult uh, topic to navigate. And you know, we've that. had. We've had a few over the years. I want to say in the hundreds of cases that I've worked, I've, I've really encountered two clearly false claims. They were both managed and, um, and addressed within a week. Yeah, now, think... that doesn't mean, and I think this is important for pastors to hear, that doesn't mean that there will not be falsehood in a claim. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, want to, I think we should distinguish between the two. I think this is where a lot of pastors get hung up. Victims, as you know, and you can probably explain this a lot more clearly than I could, um, may exaggerate. They may not be able to articulate things well. When you talk about trauma-induced and trauma-informed responses, you may, within the claims, statements, accusations, you may find falsehood, things that are not clearly true or may be contradictory. That doesn't mean it's a false claim. It, it's just a, a tertiary issue. So we address truth when we can address truth, right? And you find the same thing in perpetrators' accounts, right? They're much more blatantly false in their descriptions. But I had an advocate tell me that early in the process. She said, everybody's lying to you. She didn't mean that everybody was um, making false claims. What she meant was not everything you're hearing is completely accurate. So when we say believe a victim, that doesn't mean that we're wholesale swallowing every little nuance. It means that we're supporting them in their claim and we understand and agree that they're experiencing a really difficult destructive situation is that fair yeah well i think the thing is that as victims we lie to ourselves so i remember standing up in front of a judge one time and saying your honor this has not been an abusive relationship well mm -hmm. um and yep. it certainly had i just didn't know how to define it yet and mm -hmm. so i lied to myself so much that what i was telling myself came out to other people because yeah. I've had pastors go, well, if this has been so bad for so long, why didn't we hear from her? Why did, you know, 
Or I've had one pastor say, you know, she told me this stuff. I went and confronted her husband, which is a big no-no. Um, and, and then she, I bring him into the office and she recanted everything. Right. Right. Because, you know, you've got to know how to handle it and you can't just go out and automatically confront when you've heard these right. stories because you could endanger a victim uh, quite a bit. So yeah, that's why, that's why additional training and education at the church is so important. And one of the areas, again, where church discipline is such a tricky, if it's a mechanism. And what I mean by that, I find with, especially within larger churches, there's a formula for discipline. And the church will follow the formula. And sometimes we can get caught up in our systems and we forget that to, to get caught up with people. Yeah. And I just want to recommend anybody who practices discipline that wisdom and human contact have got to be part of your process. It is not a formula. It's a family. Yeah. And so it's important that we get to know people. We're not investigating as much as we are investing. And those are two very different things, right? I'm not looking to, to catch somebody up. I'm not, in a, I'm not practicing entrapment. I'm practicing empowerment. So there's your pithy statements, right? I'm not investigating. I'm investing. I'm not entrapping. I'm empowering. So I'm not looking to pull the snare because these are brothers and sisters that I'm trying to restore, uh, help them see their need for their relationship with God. And Matthew 18 is a great passage for that. Part of my dilemma has been that many victims I've worked with and talked to uh, they are practicing Matthew 18, and then the church is, I think, unknowingly and blindly undermining the process. Because if if you've got a sister who comes to you, pastor, and they disclose abuse, I've had so many pastors initiate church discipline at that point. But church discipline started at the moment she confronted her husband. If she's, you're, you're now the witness, right? You're the second party, or perhaps you're the third step. Maybe she's gone to somebody else. This came up in PeaceWorks University yesterday, Joy. I don't know if you were on the, the Q&A call, but this came up about uh, pastors and leaders accusing victims of gossip by talking to someone in the church. Well, isn't that the second step of Matthew 18? If it's clumsy, then correct the clumsiness, but don't call it gossip if somebody's seeking help right? Because you go and you find someone else to come alongside and help you confront. If yeah. that doesn't lead to repentance, then you call the church. Yeah. So I think sometimes we're elongating the process of Matthew 18 by restarting. And when we do that, we invalidate uh, the victim. And I'll go a step further. And I don't mean this unlovingly. I just think we got to wake up to it. Mm -hmm. uh, if she goes to a sister in the church, and then those women come to you and you start the process all over again, you're very possibly invalidating the fact that they're sisters. Yeah. They're yeah. just as much part of the body as, as you are. They, they need to be respected enough to, to be part of the process. Yeah. One of the, the ladies we work with was recently called into the church office and, you know, she has, she is in a bad spot um, yeah. in every possible way. And um, I'm thinking, well, maybe they're going to do something to help. And instead they brought her in to talk to her about how she had been talking to other people. Right. And, and if she didn't like the counseling that she was getting at the church, then, then fine, you know, she should just let them know, but she shouldn't go out and gossip. And she really wasn't trying to gossip. Yeah. She was just trying to get help. Like I need help. Please somebody help me. And, and so, you know, instead of bringing her in and still, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like re-victimizing over yeah. and over and over again. Um, you know, yeah. she was devastated by that. Um, yeah. She held her own very well. But um, anyway, it just, it blows my mind because they're, more, I guess, more concerned about their reputation or I, I don't. Yeah, think I think sometimes people want to protect the reputation of the church rather than the the um, life of their sister. And, and a lot of that, again, I I mean, we could be incredibly hard and maybe we should be sometimes, but again, a lot of that comes out of not understanding the dynamics of the problem and really the, the impact yeah. and what this individual is experiencing. And then going back to the, the, the falsehood, we don't really have the, I'd say this, like the whole train, we don't really have the whole picture sometimes as pastors. And the assumption is we have to have the whole picture before we act. And so we need to take our time, but you never take your time to provide for someone's safety or sanity. Yeah, take your time if you need to for procedural things, but really provide for safety, sanity, and security, you know, yeah. quickly, uh, and you'll actually be doing a service. And uh, let's add practical needs to that because we're looking yeah. at somebody who basically has become homeless and jobless yeah. and all sorts of things, and so 
you know, to be talking to somebody like that, who I know, I'm sure has PTSD and, and, and basically reprimanding them even for anything. And I understand, I mean, I am not faulting the church. I've been doing this a long time and it took me a long time to get to where I am. There have been yeah. times early awesome. on when I first came out, my goal was the same. It's like, let's save this marriage. Let's save this marriage. And before yeah. I even recognized my own situation as abusive, I did the same thing. So I'm not yeah. here to, I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying it's not, you're not seeing, I love your analogy. You're not seeing the whole train. You're not seeing everything that goes on. My, my analogy is this is an iceberg. You're seeing yeah. you know, 10 to 15% of what's going on. Yeah. And only the people who live in that household know the depth of what's happening. Right. Um, so, you know, we want, we want to appeal to churches to move forward, to be safer. And in that, I think we're, I don't, I don't mean to, to be, um, uh, I don't mean to come off as insensitive at all. I think we should expect the church to kind of clumsily move forward. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we'll, we'll repair as we go for sure. So we're going to expect some clumsy stuff, but addressing it is important. And then we're going to kind of fix those uh, clumsiness. You know, a couple of the things we can fix is just by going back to the scriptures, Joy. You know, Matthew 18 is most commonly used, but, you know, there's some other passages I would really encourage churches to talk about, like 1 Corinthians 5 there's some sin that's so gross and so demonstrative and so um, wicked that the apostle Paul uh, didn't need to convene a groups of people. He didn't call for witnesses per se. He just excommunicated. He just called for the excommunication of the person. And so there's some cases, um, uh, physical violence, sexual assault, rape, that the church really doesn't need to drag their feet on. Uh, obviously it's up to the leadership of that particular church, but if you've got someone in your church being sexually assaulted, uh, raped, uh, physically assaulted, it, there really isn't a need to debate the issue. You can, you can cast that person out immediately. There's scriptural precedent for that. And that actually sends a message to the perpetrator, any other perpetrators in your midst and that victim that you care for their safety. And so there is precedent for that. The other scripture that's really prominent, yeah, I think it's Titus 3, uh, warn a divisive person two times and then have nothing to do with them. We've seen this used against victims rarely, but it does get used against victims. Typically what happens is a victim has been crying out for help for a significant period of time. Uh, word has spread throughout the church. The leadership has not acted. Other people are really upset about it. They want something done. Factions begin to develop, and then the church disciplines her for being divisive. Uh, when really we should have been practicing Matthew 18 years ago. Yes. So, but the, the, the difference is with a divisive person, he causes factions and divisions for the sheer pleasure of watching people blow up. Yeah. Right. And we're talking about an oppressed person calling out for help and in, in desperation, which is very different from somebody who is, you know, stirring the pot just to see things stink. And that's, we, we'd actually encounter that a lot with abusive men. And uh, so I use that divisive passage when I have guys who are really like, I'm going to seek justice for myself, right? I'm going to be, you know, lifted up and how that pride plays in, we'll use that passage. Well, but those are the three institutional passages that we use. Yeah. And they also turn themselves into the victim suddenly. They know how to spin some stories, don't they? Yeah. So um, I want to go, I'm going to move over a little bit because you, we, we, we are talking about how so often um, victims are brought under church discipline a lot of times for separating. I find more churches are tolerant of the separation than divorce. So um, I recently did an interview, and if people want to go back and watch the interviews with the different pastors that I did, um, Dr. Um, Stephen Wade, who's a professor here at Southeastern Baptist Theological and uh, a, a pastor of a church here locally, and Dr. Wade is actually a permanence view kind of guy. Oh yeah. And and I was so thrilled. I I went in to do to advocate for one of the ladies in our group to um, help her as she was trying to explain to the church what was going on. And he he just sat and he listened. And um, she brought in a couple of other witnesses as well. And so he listened to the story and then he um, asked her, do you think this marriage can be saved? And she said, not without a miracle. And, um, and then he asked me and I'm thinking, oh, he wants me to say yes. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, at that point, there wasn't a lot of hope and, uh, or even help for the perpetrator. And um, 
but, but then he said, I don't, he says, I've been doing this a long time. And he says, I see that guys like this don't often, or they're not willing to change. Mm -hmm. And, and so basically he looked at her and he said, you know what, we're not going to focus on this marriage right now. We're going to focus on you and your, get your girls get, or your children getting healing, finding healing. Yeah. I was like, they, I told people later, the, um, the, the skies opened up, the angels came down and I was hearing the hallelujah chorus in my head <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was, you know, doing this for 20 years. I don't hear things like that very often. Right. And then later she did decide to go ahead and file for divorce. And even though he was permanent view kind of guy, he said, I would prefer that you do this. This is what my conviction is. But we all know that those kinds of convictions, as far as divorce and remarriage goes, that very genuine and well-educated scholars differ on, the, Absolutely. You know, on that. So he said, there are people, you know, in our board of elders who believe that abuse is grounds. And so we will not do anything. We're going to continue to support you. And that's, you know, we're not asking people to change their theology. We're just asking them to love well, yep. to provide support instead of re-victimizing a pers person who has already been victimized. And sometimes I find that as long as a perpetrator thinks that there's hope for his marriage and the church stays involved and there's just a separation. And a lot of times the church will say, well, don't, you can't even file legal separation. So what that, ha I have seen that happen so many times where in the meantime, the perpetrator took all the money and it leaves these victims destitute many times because right. you say, no, you can't do this. You can't, I mean, really and truly, you know, you've got to start looking out for the needs of your people and, and protecting them, uh, yep. protecting your sheep. But, um, you know, it's just, it's mind boggling for me to see it turn that way. Um, but it's beautiful when somebody can, even in, when their theology doesn't necessarily even agree with the divorce. And I think that article that I read with Jim Newhouser in the second, I think he, he edited it and said, yeah, he did. we won't do church discipline. So depending, even, you know, based on your convictions, I'd like to see him go further and say, right. you know, obviously, but you know, I'm not there to, um, yep. to change a, a pastor's theology. If you are a permanence view, that's kind of the person that is fine. As long as you are providing support for these victims and for their children, because, yep. because what is happening to them has damaged their, their view of God mm -hmm. and it has damaged their view of themselves. And they already feel that they are under condemnation and they are filled with shame. And so when that happens, it's like, they just feel like the lowest of low. I have so many of them struggle with suicidal feelings or thoughts. Um, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times I see that. So, you know, I think this, um, what you're articulating is, this is really important for uh, advocates and people helpers too, I think to understand because what you're, when we've talked about this so many times, and I think maybe one of the reasons why, um, why you say that about, your theology is, is kind of secondary. And I say the same thing because I know we've talked about this all the time is because we're, we love one, we love the church. I, I really do love the church. And then two, we've worked with churches and uh, we, we have so many peers, I think, and this is good for all people helpers to hear because we have so many peers who are really, I think, looking for that perfect church or that one theological position. And I've had uh, people say to me, well, you can't work with permanence people. You can't work with complementarian churches. You can't work with uh, Presbyterians. You can't work with Pentecostals. It's like, who can I work with, right? And I think part of that is because we have tied a theological position to, to an outcome. And what you're proving with uh, Dr. Wade and what I've seen with other friends that I've worked with is that, you know, our goal is not to get everybody into the same theological camp but our goal is to provide for safety uh, for the people that are, that are in these relationships and for victims in these relationships. And uh, I just think that the permanence folks, our permanence friends just have more work, but that doesn't mean that they have to change their theology. So I really appreciate that. That's important for advocates to hear and church discipline falls into that because if you categorically are part of a church that regularly practices church discipline, I think the temptation that you run is to view it as a formula. And what we're asking is in cases of, well, every case, but specifically in these cases, can you really bring the familial aspects back uh, and practice discipline in a, in a winsome way, in a remedial restorative way, as opposed to always seeing it as punitive? 
And we don't want you to stop practicing church discipline, right? We just want you to care for the people in your church. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, have the goal of restoring relationship to God yep. and possibly to one another, you know, if there is true repentance. But again, um, I, I don't think that's a call that a church can make. And, to, you know, personally, my theology is on that is that they, that, uh, abuser has broken the covenant right and that um you know, I, I believe they should be free but you know and i think that the church discipline should happen where the perpetrator is you know brought under church discipline and and maybe even put out of the church as an unbeliever and so that right. makes, you know the, the victim is free um according that to really that. helps with your first corinthians 7 arguments yeah. Right. And so that just really helps the church kind of shore things up. If you're a first Corinthians seven abandonment view um, church on divorce, that discipline process really helps with that. The other passage uh, real quick that I use with men a lot. I think this is important as you're working with perpetrators. So if anybody's actually engaged in a disciplinary process and you're working with a, a man in particular who's been abusive, I use Galatians six quite a bit. Uh, brothers, if any of you are caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore such a one. That's the burden bearing passage. We tend to use it when people are hurting, but really the passage is about people who are sinning. And uh, brothers, if any of you are caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, so the mature in the family, should restore them with gentleness. But we should watch ourselves so that we're not tempted. I think this is a big, I would call that collusion, right? Uh, for many of us men, we are tempted to collude with an abuser rather than to hold them accountable. And the, the idea of bearing the sins of another person is that we carry the load with them through remedial discipleship, correction, uh, so that they can carry their own load. And that's what we want to see is we want to see men who are repentant and can carry their own load, own their own sin, right? Grow in their own spiritual maturity. And if they're unwilling to do that, then we know. Yeah. Right. Then we know we're dealing with an unbeliever and uh, we can make the appropriate responses according to Matthew 18. Yeah. Now the problem is a lot of times they are willing to on the surface and yet, uh, you know, there's still this, um, I love it. We talked about it. I think, um, in another video that we did, um, repentant abusers and mm -hmm. angry, or I can't remember what we talked angry about. victims or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But I, that's what I see a lot of times is I had a, a church tell me, well, you know, we had, um, you know, we definitely, we, we, we asked them to separate because of abuse and he was definitely abusive. But now I think she's the angry one. And I think she's the abusive one again, not understanding trauma, um, or yeah, power. I, yeah. We definitely, yeah. we work with the victims to try to help them not to come across that way. Um, mm -hmm. but they do seem a lot more emotional and upset. Yeah. And, they don't see what's going on at home, but what we've done is we made what did, what did you you're, you said um, we've made more polite abusers because they're still yeah. being abusive. <laughs> yeah, so there's usually like in my mark there's there's three there's three aspects of repentance that we we tend to ignore. Two of them, there's a behavioral aspect, there's a motivational aspect, and a relational aspect. We tend to really highlight the behavioral changes. Wow, he's he's not uh, kicking the dog anymore, mm -hmm. right? Well, he's now he's passive aggressive. It's coming from the same heart, right? If we haven't had that motivational heart level change that says at the relational level, I want to, I want my relationship with God, right? I want the glory of God and conformity to Christ more than I want to breathe. I want to conform to Christ and glorify God more than I want to see my marriage go back to normal. In fact, I don't want my marriage to go back to normal, yeah, right? Yeah. If God restores it, I want it to be based on him. Yeah. Right. And so that relational aspect and motivational, I live for the glory of God. I don't live for my own comfort or control. Those are the things that have to be put off and put on to see that real behavioral change. And we use Ephesians four as our model, you know, when's a liar, no longer a liar. Well, it's when he's a truther. When's a thief, no longer a thief. Well, it's when he's generous and that doesn't happen with initial repentance. It happens through long standing observable change that says I used to steal for a living now I work for a living. I've worked so hard that I've saved enough that now I'm readily known as somebody who gives my money away. So when's an abuser no longer an abuser? It's not when he plays nice. It's just not. Could he really be repentant? Sure, but we need time, right? And observable, measurable, repeatable evidence that he's now a gentle person, an encouraging person, God's kind of person. And you don't determine that with, uh, you know, I've cried, I'm a little contrite. 
that doesn't determine holiness. We believe in progressive sanctification. Maybe, maybe if you don't, maybe you are a one and done sanctified person. I, I love you, but I think even my one and done friends um, demand change at a long lasting level. And so for those of us who are, you know, progressive sanctification people, why don't we just give repentance time to be observed? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as well as I do, that it really does take time to gain oh, yeah. true, true repentance. Um, and it, it's a long term uh, process. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I do want to just go back a little bit to um, talk about it. I think a lot of times, too, with the churches, they see physical abuse. They, that's clear cut. They yep. will come in. They will uh, stand in the gap for the victims quite often, not always. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to you know the more covert types of abuse, the intimidation, um, you know the put downs, the financial abuse, the things that we see on a regular basis, they don't see that as abusive. And I'm, so when somebody is but here's the thing it has so much of an impact on victims i mean physical impact they can a lot of them we see will cause high blood pressure it causes uh, again um a, a try um, a form of ptsd there mm -hmm. yeah. that also just comes along with a host of physical mm -hmm. digestive problems uh, anxiety related problems like headaches and, and tension um muscle pain joint pain Right. So there are physical ramifications. Yeah. Yeah. And again, um, well, so many of them we see become suicidal. Our, yeah. our ministry recently did a survey of about 200 victims. And we asked them, when you were in the worst of your abuse, what would your heart cry to God? And uh, uh, at least a third of them said, God, just let me die. I yeah. don't live anymore. And I felt the same way. If it weren't for my children, I don't know that I would be here today. I, yeah. I felt like there was no escape. There was no way out. So understanding the huge impact that this is having on these lives, yeah. um, it, maybe if you could understand the impact, then you wouldn't be so quick to come in and go, well, let's just save the marriage and right. about the people in the marriage, because that is not mm -hmm. Jesus's heart. You know, right. the Pharisees brought him that woman who was caught in adultery, mm -hmm. and he uh, saw her. He didn't yeah. see her sin. Or, and not saying, again, um, that these victims obviously are not without sin. They're, they're sin oh, yeah. response to sin. They're angry so many times. Um, yet, I told a pastor recently, I said, yeah, but we're not looking at, uh, it, it's not an even playing field here. We've right. got an oppressor and we've got an oppressed. And yeah. I believe scripture is very clear that we should come alongside those who are oppressed. Well, I even encourage pastors to contextualize their understanding, right? So her sin is not, we're not to judge her sin in the context of his use of violence or abuse. I, I use the terms interchangeably, but um, we, we, we address his abuse, right? Her sin doesn't cause it. That doesn't mean it doesn't need to be addressed for her help, for her health. My goodness. Yes. And her sanity so with pastors who are struggling with the emotional abuse category. I get it. Um, for me, the most helpful allies in that, so if you're a pastor watching this, is a good advocate, somebody who's really been through this work, someone like Joy, because what Joy can do in her time interviewing and working with the victim is she can get details that sometimes you as a pastor are not going to be able to draw out, and that's really going to be helpful to you because you're going to be thinking by two or three witnesses, right? So if you've got somebody who's really equipped and skilled like Joy who can patiently walk with a victim and now you're not just hearing terms like emotional abuse but you're seeing the ridicule you're seeing the manipulation you're seeing the isolation and you have specific instances that you can begin to put the fruit on the tree that really is super beneficial for me most pastors i talk to are frustrated because they hear the ethereal term emotional abuse and then they say well how is he emotionally abusing you and you know full well in that moment, victims are either freezing up or they're over talking. Yeah. And again, this is not to, this is not to blame the victim. It's just the nature of the beast. So most pastors are not equipped to draw out that information and patiently work through it. And so all they're hearing is either over talking that doesn't seem specific or they're hearing nothing specific. And so that's, what's really helpful to get them connected to an advocate who can walk through, take the time, and really build you a more comprehensive understanding of what aspects of emotional abuse are happening. And that'll really give you a lot more clarity. And then once you consider this has been happening for 10 years, 
20 years on a consistent basis and that weight's been pushing down, that really adds some clarity. And then second to that, most of the time I found, not always, emotional abuse is significant and it's reinforced by the threat of physical force yeah. or a past use of physical force. And so even one incident of physical violence can be enough to maintain that level of oppression or I'll go one more step. Even the threat of physical violence can be enough to maintain uh, that level of oppression. Am I on to something, Joy? Are you with oh, me on that? Absolutely. And that's what I mean. The look, there's a look mm -hmm. that but behind that look, there are, there are like a multitude of actions that have happened in the past that, um, that were terrible. And so yep. that, that instills this huge fear. And I want to go back to what you were talking about, about having an advocate that is so important um, because they do tend to use these very general terms. And like I had one of the ladies say, well, my husband got angry. Well, if you being a godly man gets angry, you don't do the same things that her husband was doing. So like, <laughs> what did that look like? Let's talk about the actions, the activities that occurred when he got angry while well, he was kicking the trash can across the room. He did this and that. And, you know, the girls ran or, you know, things right. like that happen. And uh, or, yep. or they may say, we got into an argument. I said, well, let's talk about what did that yep. argument look like? That wasn't an argument. An argument takes two people. It was somebody bulldozing the other person. Yeah. So the, you're right to have an advocate to draw out what's going on. I liked it. What you said, somebody to take the 80 pages that they've written and turn it into two coherent pages that <laughs> give you a, like a bottom line. I love, you know, you came last year and we did uh, that, uh, um, developing a church-wide response yeah. to abuse where we talked about having a team approach to dealing with domestic abuse. And, and I think that that's what we, we really got to do. You've got to bring in people who have some expertise in this because it is just such a tricky issue. We're not, um, not trying to be, be here and promote our self-interest. It really is all about how, if you're going to serve the oppressed well, then you've got to bring in people who understand the dynamics uh, because it is just one of those things that if you don't understand it, you're very, very likely to mishandle it. Yep. I'll give you two categories of folks, uh, pastors, that you can be looking to to help you on the advocacy role. The, the two groups of people that I found that make the best advocates in this type of work within the Christian church and within my world, which is biblical counseling in particular, number one are survivors who are spiritually mature, meaning they've, they're not currently in their situation, they're not closely removed from it, but they've been growing in Christ after abuse, right? So survivors make incredible advocates when, as, as Joy often says, when they're properly healed, when they've experienced God's grace and freedom. The second group that I'm finding, and this is, might shock some people listening, are skilled female biblical counselors. I'm finding these lay people in churches that have spent years working with women, once they're exposed to the dynamic and impact are putting the dots together quickly. And they're already really skilled at asking questions. So when a female biblical counselor shifts her focus from um, sin and suffering to safety, she's already got all the skills. She just changes her gaze slightly and becomes a very successful advocate. I've worked with uh, two biblical, three biblical counselors right now in particular um, who are killing it. They're just knocking it out of the park. They always come back to the team meetings with the best data, the best information, and they always represent uh, the victim well by offering her concerns and then balancing it out with, and by the way, here's what we're working on. So just so you know, we're not, we're not just bashing Jimbo in our meetings. We're really working on this particular aspect of growing in godliness, but here's her concerns and they're valid because of these reasons. And I've found that biblical counselors really operate analytically and logically in those meetings and do a great job when they're skilled and when they shift their gaze from sin and suffering to safety. I've just found them to be tremendous benefits. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like uh, Mindy Williams, who spoke at our conference recently. So. Mindy's a great example. Yeah. She's a great example. Yeah, so that's my first thought when you said that. And she's does mm -hmm. an amazing job. And again, you said female. And it may be, maybe part of the whole breakdown here is a uh, difference in the sexes and the way we process things. Who knows? We ain't got, we ain't got time to get into <laughs> Next, Next conversation. 
<laughs> yep, because we've been on this almost an hour, so I think we're going to... Yeah. <laughs> Time just flies when you have a I know, time. I know. So um, anything, any last words you want to add? Yeah, you know, churches, we we value you and church leaders that practice and exercise church discipline. You are doing what God's called you to do. I, I believe that discipline should be part of the life of the local church. We just want to commend you for the good things you're doing and then warn you as people who love you that uh, this process needs a familial touch, a relational reality, needs wisdom. And so we believe in you. And so we're inviting you to kind of lock arms with us. If you don't have the adequate training, you don't feel like you've got the education, then reach out to Call to Peace, reach out to PeaceWorks. We'd be happy to uh, get some information to you and help any way that we can. Amen. Well, that was very well said, and I think that's a good place to end. Thank you. So <laughs> awesome. Much. Thank All you. Right.